Batrachian is one of those pieces that just popped into my head fully formed. Or rather, it came out as a drawing in the margins when I was taking notes in college classes. This rather melancholy, thoughtful figure with his frog hands and feet is hard for me to trace back to any one inspiration. It just made some kind of sense to me. I created him when I was a junior at the University of Oregon in Eugene. And I know, there's probably room for a joke here about the influence of the rainy dampness of my surroundings. I was studying human anatomy and figurative sculpture under Professor Paul Buckner, and we would work from live models. But I didn't have a direct model for this piece. He was more of a compilation, although there was a handsome stranger I would see on the bus whose face is echoed on this figure. Usually you would make the original art in some kind of clay, but I created the original in solid wax, this dark burgundy colored kind called victory wax that's used for making bronzes. Back when I made this piece in 1997, I had planned to cast it into bronze, and then our school foundry was shut down due to structural issues and Batrachian languished in wax. A longtime friend and collector of several of my felt pieces had been agitating for me to cast Batrachian in bronze for years, and I finally did in September of 2011. I had already made a very complicated mold so that I could cast a plaster version back in 2005, so Batrachian could be in a figurative show. By that point, I was worried that the wax version wasn't going to hold up much longer. Now, mold making is an art form in and of itself. You have to think sort of inside out and backwards to figure out how to surround a complicated shape with materials that are both flexible and rigid in a way that the mold can be removed. The most common solution to this is to make a soft and flexible rubber mold and surround it with a rigid plaster mold. You can see how the rubber captures every detail, and the pieces are engineered with these bumps called keyholes to align the parts of the mold back together like puzzle pieces. When you take a piece of art to a foundry to reproduce it in bronze, they can do every step for you. They have a ton of experience making molds. I was a little concerned that my mold wouldn't be up to par, but it turned out mine would work just fine. So I brought my mold to Artworks Foundry in Berkeley, California, where they completed the casting and patina process over the course of about seven weeks. So what is this whole process? Lost wax casting works like this. The artist makes the original artwork in whatever material, typically clay, and then a mold is made around it in order to create an exact copy. Again, a rubber mold is good because it can capture a lot of detail and it's flexible so it's easy to remove from complicated shapes. You have to create a harder plaster mold around it as a shell to hold that flexible rubber mold. Then you remove the original art and set it aside and reassemble the molds. Next you pour melted wax into the void to create a replica of the original artwork in wax. After you remove the mold, you clean up the wax version, if necessary, and at this stage the artist checks the work and, if it's acceptable, signs the wax version, with the number of the edition, how many will be made of this particular piece. I've limited Batrachian to an edition of 12, so I inscribed my name and 1 of 12 and 2 of 12 on the two I've had cast so far. Next you have to attach little pieces of wax called sprues that will act like channels for the molten bronze and escaping air to travel through. You don't want trapped air bubbles in toes, for example, because when air takes up space meant for bronze, you end up with a toeless foot. A pouring cup is added next. This will allow for the bronze to flow more smoothly into the piece. Remember that everything that's now wax will create a void that will be filled up by bronze. The wax elements are basically placeholders. Then this whole thing is coated in ceramic shell. The piece is dipped in a milky liquid silica mixture and stucco powder, allowed to dry and harden, and then coated again and again until a proper thickness is achieved. Then it's put in a kiln, heated, and the wax version is melted out of the ceramic shell, thus the term lost wax. Everything that was wax is now an empty void inside the strong shell, which is like a one-time use mold. While the shell is still hot, a team of artisans pours liquid molten bronze into the shell, filling that void created by the wax. After it cools, the shell is then broken off, leaving a raw bronze version of the original artwork. Next comes chasing, the term for cleaning up, repairing, and refining the bronze cast. This includes grinding off the leftover nubbins from those wax sprues, sandblasting, and fixing any imperfections. And now the piece that started out in an altogether different material is reproduced exactly in bronze and it's ready for color. I return to Artworks Foundry first to check, sign, and number the wax versions, and then again weeks later to approve the final cast and watch the patina process. 
A patina refers to the surface coloring, which can come about naturally through aging and weathering, but can also be created very deliberately with the application of heat and particular chemicals. On the wall here you can see a range of tones you can get. For Betrachean I knew I wanted a greenish tone. It was only appropriate for a frogman. First the piece is cleaned, then heated. Heating excites the molecules in the bronze, causing them to sort of jiggle around on a molecular scale, opening the surface to accept chemicals that are sprayed or brushed on. The first chemical to be applied is liver of sulfur, which gives the piece a darker undertone. You can see the shiny gold color is turning a darker reddish brown color. Then comes a layer of cupric nitrate, a copper chemical that creates blues and greens. The piece is laid on its side and constantly heated and turned around to get an even application. The patina artist then adds a subsequent layer of ferric nitrate, an iron chemical, to give it a bit more of a yellowish green tone. Then the piece is sanded back, revealing more of the bronze color on the high areas and leaving more green color in the low areas. When the piece is done, it's allowed to cool down, which can take a while, and then it's waxed. Here you can see variations in color and pattern between the two pieces I had cast at the same time. Some artists have a very precise vision for the patina appearance and insist that it be as identical as possible throughout an addition. For this piece I wanted a general green tone and preferred to let the texture of the sculpture and the application of the patina combine to create unique but similar effects on each piece. But the final color of a bronze piece can make a world of difference and the skill and experience of the patina artist allows for endless possibilities. It's truly a blending of art and chemistry. And now Betrachean, the Frogman, is finally finished. I delivered number one of the addition to the collector and thanked him profusely for urging me to finally follow this process through. As you've seen, the lost wax casting process is complicated and labor intensive, but with a team of skilled artisans at the foundry, an artist like myself can be assured that the original piece will be reproduced faithfully and beautifully in bronze. And I think I know which piece I'll cast in bronze next. Pink is for Girls came out of an exercise re-examining fairy tale archetypes. It depicts a lovely and feminine young lady who can rescue herself, thank you very much. I wonder what chemicals it takes to make a pink patina.